Hello everybody and welcome back to Red Eagle Politics. Make sure you like this video down below and subscribe to the channel if you are new. So Donald Trump has won yet again in another proxy war between him and the GOP establishment as businessman outsider Tim Michaels has defeated Rebecca Kleefish by a wider margin than initially expected. And there were a lot of votes that went to other candidates that either dropped out or were just in the race that kind of arguably were to the right of Michaels or at least in that same category. And Michaels probably could have won by a wider margin if they dropped out earlier or they dropped out at all in the case of Tim Ramthan. But either way, a big victory. And a lot of the polls had it 50-50. A lot of them had Cleefish ahead. It didn't matter. Tim Michaels at the end of the day. And I called this, by the way. I said that I believe that Trump's influence in the GOP went up after the bogus raid on his house for documents that Trump has not obtained or had since January 2021. And they found the safe. And what was in the safe? Nothing. Couldn't find anything. Either way, I said if Michaels wins by anything more than a nail biter, we know this to be confirmed. And Michaels, I think, won by more than a nail biter. He didn't win by like 10, but he won by over five. And that was huge. And he definitely got a bump because of the FBI raid on Trump that backfired because Trump's not guilty of anything. And it raises Trump's influence in the GOP. And it makes our intelligence agencies look even worse than they currently already are, especially in the public's eye. So all that is good. So we'll talk about this a little bit more. But first, I have to tell you guys about my very good friends over at Noble Gold. Uh, one of the sponsors of our show, as many of you know, is Noble Gold, and it's just been picked by Consumer Affairs, the rating agency, as the overall number one gold IRA company in the United States. Talk to the team today if you're thinking of precious metals, and if you're quick, they're giving away an incredible 10-ounce American Eagle gold-proof coin with every qualifying IRA or 401k rollover. You cannot go wrong with Noble Gold, so call the team now at 877-646-5347 to find out more, or visit noblegoldinvestments.com. So we had the raid on Trump's house, and then we have Trump's epic, massive victory. And it wasn't the only victory of the night, and there were some moral victories. Uh, and I'm calling them moral victories because it didn't seem like anything of the sort had any chance of being close. But we'll get to that as we go on. There was also a congressional race in Minnesota that everybody is dooming over. I'm going to explain why they should not be dooming. It's dumb. They shouldn't do it. But Tim Michaels came out on top and he won big. Like the counties that went for Cleefish uh, were the counties that are typically your establishment GOP counties, Waukesha and Ozaukee. Washington is a little bit more white working class. It's one of the wow counties that Trump has really maintained the past Republican margins in. And Michaels took that county by nine percentage points. Ozaki went for Cleefish by just five. That's arguably the most establishment. And Waukesha went for Cleefish by six to seven. And then you had some other counties that you know went for Cleefish that have a similar type of Republican. Dane County, that was Cleefish's best county. It was also, I believe, John Kasich's best county in the 2016 primary. Go figure, that's Madison. Not a lot of Republicans there. And the Republicans that are there are just downright awful unless they happen to like live in the outskirts of Madison or in some of the, you know, more exurban or rural parts of Dane County. Uh, so keep that in mind. And there were some ancestrally Republican counties upstate that did go for Cleefish, but those were the anomalies. Like even Milwaukee County was pretty close, but the rural counties, you look at the size of the lead there in a lot of these places, Fond du Lac County, which is, I believe, where Michael's business is from, he won that county 64 to 28. And that's not, a, that's not exactly a, a small county either. But a lot of these rural counties, he was running up the margins. He was winning 60 to 30 in all of them. The driftless area, the Obama-Trump area, the disaffected white working class area. You look at a lot of these counties that went for Obama, then Trump, then Evers than Trump. They're coming out big for Tim Michaels, which leads me to believe that Tim Michaels is that guy. He's doing very well in the areas he needs to do better than Scott Walker 2018 into defeat Tony Evers. And I firmly believe at the end of the day that he will. Republican turnout in this primary, 700,000 votes or so. That's huge. I mean, we could look at the Dem side uh, for all of these races here, 501,000 uh, for, for the Dems in terms of their Senate primary, which was not as contested as it would have been, uh, given the fact that some candidates dropped out. But a lot of these people did vote by mail. 
And Mandela Barnes is going to be their nominee, who is insane and will lose to Ron Johnson, who won his primary fairly easily there. And you look at some of these other races, the Secretary of State race. Again, the Secretary of State race doesn't really have much pull regarding elections in Wisconsin, unlike it does in other states, uh, because the position doesn't really deal with it. But a lot of the people running were trying to change it and you know take control, which is interesting. So we'll see what happens come election day there. And regarding the AG's race, two relatively solid candidates. It was a pure toss-up, as you could see here. Eric Tony ended up winning. He did better in the driftless area, too, so arguably that's a good sign. Kenosha, again, Kenosha coming out big for a lot of the Trump candidates as well. And uh, you look at what's going on there. Uh, 2020, you had the riots, and Trump did better in Kenosha than he did in 2016, and he'll likely continue to do better in 2024 as the years go on. So... Keep this in mind, Van Orden won his primary. He was uncontested. And then you had the state legislature primary. Robin Voss, the speaker, was facing an outsider challenger, and Robin Voss barely got by. So pressure has been put on him. You can maybe call that a moral victory there. Uh, but that's really it for Wisconsin. I wanted to pivot to Minnesota. We'll talk about the first district uh, special election in a second, but I wanted to point out that Ilan Omar won her primary by just two points. And she's an incumbent. She got by fairly easily last time. I believe she got close to around 60% of the primary vote. She was facing a challenger, Don Samuels, and she was caught off guard. She only won by 2%. So that's very interesting to see because you usually don't see people get primaried out from the right on the Dem side or from the left on the Republican side. Uh, one could say that Steve King was the lone exception because everybody just abandoned him in the party establishment. But Ilan Omar, you know, they've ran cover for her on numerous occasions. It's not like Don Samuels got all this high profile, you know, endorsement slate from Congress, but he apparently almost knocked her off. So people are fed up with even these so called, you know, more progressive, far left Bernie bros in places like Minneapolis. They can barely get by, even if they're the incumbent which says something like a lot of the Somalis are not not too uh not too fond of Ilan Omar anymore very interesting it's it's a very interesting result to see there now this race is not probably going to flip in November because of the fact that it's like still d plus 40 or whatever although it likely will be closer than that it might end up being d plus 30 Omar definitely underperformed in the district by a lot back in 2020 uh compared to Joe Biden so we'll see at the end of the day, but very interesting results out of Minnesota's fifth congressional district there. Uh, beyond that point, uh, everybody really knew the statewide races and how they would go because the state party endorsed uh, the candidates and a lot of people just dropped out. Scott Jensen is the nominee for governor. Uh, Schultz beat Doug Wardlow for the attorney general, which is interesting there. You might see Ellison go down in this environment. You might get a statewide officer in uh, Minnesota that actually has an R next to their name. Very interesting. Haven't seen one of those since like 2006. And that was the governor who was a total rhino centrist. And before that, you'd have to go, I believe, all the way back to like 2002 just to find a Republican winning statewide in the state of Minnesota, which has been 20 years. It's a, it's a drought. It's like the Detroit Lions <laughs> winning a playoff game. It's a, it's the Minnesota electing a Republican statewide official. It just, you don't see it happen. So we'll see. I mean, Nixon was the last Republican to win it, and that was in his 1972 landslide. So go figure. But either way, now it's time to talk about the special election from last night, because a lot of people are dooming about it. And I will say this was not a good result for Republicans. Uh, it was not a good result. This is a district Trump won by like nine. It is a district that is a Republican district. You're supposed to overperform. But at the end of the day, uh, Republicans only won it by four. So you could say, oh, that's an underperformance. But keep in mind, this is a district where Trump vastly outperformed down ballot Republicans. People could say it's a cope, but that's just general analysis. That's the explanation for it. Uh, in the western rural counties, you saw Finstad do very well. He dropped the ball in Olmstead County, which is where Jeff Edinger's from. I mean, that was a big thing. We would have expected it to move to the right, and if it would have happened, Finstead would have won by around 10, but it didn't. It moved to the left. Edinger ended up winning the county of Olmstead, vastly overperformed in some of these other counties in the district. The eastern rural counties, you saw Finstad underperform uh, Hagedorn, and this is interesting. He only won by four. He won. A win is a win. 
But still, he only won by 4%. So what is the takeaway here? Uh, is this a really bad result? Well, he actually outperformed Jim Hagedorn from 2020. So it depends how you look at it. Hagedorn only won by three over Dan Fian in 2020. And this said something because Bill Rood was a far left independent. You look at his platform, he's talking about, you know, single payer health care. He's talking about, you know, legalizing all drugs. It's Bernie Sanders stuff. And the guy got 6% of the vote, much of which, if not all, would have likely gone to Dan Fian. So you look at that and you say, okay, well, maybe Hagedorn would have actually lost by like two to three. So it's like a seven point over performance. Uh, compared to 2020 when you look at everything. So it's not this whole, you know, gloom and doom. Republicans have no chance. The red wave is over. Look at the polls. And it's like the polls suck. Oh, wow. What a shocker. It doesn't matter. The metrics are still there. Primary turnout in Minnesota at large. Republicans did very well compared to past years. I'm still very white-pilled surrounding the 2022 midterms. And this guy did a very good thread. I wanted to shout him out because he put a good thread together here where he said, Minnesota has always had poor turnout for GOP and primaries. And this election was held on the same day that the primary was, which is very true. And it's important to look into that. The 2018 primaries were D plus 29 and the gubernatorial election that year was a D plus 11. This is also true. Uh, and in 2020, Biden won the state by seven percentage points. Uh, this is technically true as well, but kind of beside the point. Trump won Minnesota first by 10, and incumbent Hagedorn won re-election by three. That's another thing, because down ballot, you see Republicans underperforming Trump in the ancestral D areas in many cases. And if Trump was on the ballot, you would have seen the result be very different, arguably. So they outperformed Hagedorn without Trump on the ticket. That's kind of something that, that shows you that the district is not that far gone, per se, or that the red wave is over. Apparently, the 2022 primaries are D plus 16 in the state, which is better than it was like D plus 24 or some ridiculous margin in 2018 and 2020. And already, this is an indicator that the gubernatorial election might be more competitive if you compare the primary turnout to 2018. And that's basically what it comes down to. So either way, this is not the biggest L for Republicans. It's not the biggest win. I mean, this is nothing to write home about, but it doesn't mean it's over. We have to doom, especially because it's a special election that was held in the same day that a primary was. Uh, I would arguably compare this to the 2017 Georgia's sixth election for Republicans where uh, Karen Handel actually won by a wider margin than Donald Trump did despite underperforming uh, past House Republicans significantly in that specific district. So, I mean, it is what it is. These things happen. Now, we'll see. We'll look at what happens in the New York special elections. We'll monitor the situation leading up to the 2022 midterms. But as of right now, I'm not pumping the brakes on the red wave. And Trump got his big proxy war victory in the state of Wisconsin. What primaries do we exactly have left? Well, we have New York and Florida coming up later this month. You're going to see Liz Cheney lose her job and it will be glorious, among other things, among other things. So anyways, guys, Thanks for watching this video. Like this video down below, comment down below, subscribe to the channel, hit the bell for notifications so you never miss another video. Follow me on social media. The links are all in the description down below. As always, guys, thanks for watching. Red Eagle, out.